I think it's a bit sad to base your act around football songs, so we're going to do a non-football song. colleague at work and he was always saying well that's ludicrous and uh, they named him Lord Ludicrous one of our very first songs was called Ludicrous um, and I remember crossing I was crossing the Euston Road I remember exactly where I was and I think we'd written a song called Ridiculous as well and as I was halfway across the Euston Road I had the word ridiculous in my mind and I realised it was an anagram of something ludicrous and it was I ludicrous We did have a, a sort of a vision of, of what we wanted to do, and, and, and it was summed up in the name of the band, really. You know, it was to be ludicrous and to do uh, stuff that um, maybe other people wouldn't dare to do. You know. We're from out of town, our band's broken down. We're the support band. Our mates wouldn't come. They stayed in the pub. We're the support band. Stone. He thinks we don't know, we're the support band We sound check the drums, until kick the come We're the support band hey, oh, We're the support band We go on and on and on and on and on We go Perhaps a little bit more introspective, and um, it's writing about subjects that other people 
what to write about. They, you know, the trivial, the mundane, rather than writing these great, you know, great love songs or, you know, I want to change the world and, you know. It's strange, we've never, I know Will has always wanted to do something that's got like a distinctive style running all the way through. Um, but it never seems to happen like that. And I think it's possibly because we're not a group in a traditional sense, you know, I'm like responsible for all the music. And I, I get things in my head which I want to reproduce. And, um, I mean, we're the support band was actually sort of recorded in a live setting, if you like, one take. Uh, I've proved quite, quite popular. But um, you know, when we're composing things, I get things in my head, little bits here, little bits there that I want to introduce, and you can't sort of reproduce live, um, so it doesn't always work. But um, so there's never, never been a real uniform sound, although. Because of Will's vocals, I think there is a distinctive, unmistakable sound to, to all our stuff. So this is where it all began. So, John, yeah, this is where I met John. 68 Carter Lane, uh, Finsbury Data Services, or Text Line. Tights too wide and suits too tight When I worked at Tetzline We'd all get drunk on Thursday nights When I worked at Tetzline Friday I'd roll in at ten I could hardly hold my pen Lunchtime in the pub again When I worked at Tetzline I got locked in the typing pool When I worked at Tetzline I coughed and stuttered like a fool When I worked at Tetzline The filthy things those typists said Turned my face a beetroot red I often wish I stayed in bed When I worked at Tetzline Tetzline, Tetzline If you want to interested in a career in indexing, abstracting, thesaurus control We had this not bad secretary When I worked at Techline And someone said she fancied me When I worked at Techline Well I thought this was really great So I asked her on a date She said go home and masturbate When I worked at Techline I met some funny little men When I worked at Techline Rosie, Clarky, Quinn and Glenn When I worked at Techline On the evening of my leaving do I told them a few home truths And they replied we hate you too When I worked at Techline On the evening of my leaving do I told them a few home truths And they replied we hate you too When I worked at Techline 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 It was a particularly dull job, but it was quite a, a funny place to work. It was um, the demographic. Uh, we were all basically first job out of university, all male for some reason. Um, so it was a bit like going back to school. Everyone wanted to leave that company. I didn't want to, but I was the only one who got the job somewhere else, so I left. We kept in touch with them all. I hung around on the strength of the pay, you know, or lack of it. And the group came into being when we went to see a gig in uh, Kennington. John Cooper Clark and Nico and some awful stand-up comedian. And we went off to the pub afterwards and Will said, um, I can do that, what that stand-up bloke did. And I don't know it was that, I think it might be that evening. So as a matter of fact, my mate is doing a sort of performance art gig and he's asked me to do a support slot. I said, what are you going to do then? And so I'm just going to stand up and tell everyone what I did at work that day. And I thought, well, that's great. But what you'll need is musical accompaniment. So I said, yeah, all right. So we actually took that seriously. I don't think he would. I mean, I was actually desperate to play in a group then. We were both in our late 20s, and I, I hadn't really played in a group. But I was, it was like getting too late. Was, the biological clock was ticking. Anyway, he said, well, let's rehearse. So we got together and brought some words around to my house, and I had some music already recorded. And I reckon the first song we actually did was Ludicrous, because he, he had these words. He said, I want to riff a bit like Slate's on the call. 
I got this riff, which, which was slate, unfortunately. But I went off to make a cup of tea or have a pee or something. And while I was doing that, a slight variation of the riff came into my head. I went running upstairs while I can still remember it. Pump that out, got the drums going, and that's, that's how he wrote Ludicrous. I suppose it was ludicrous was the first time I actually felt, oh wow, you know, this is actually, we could be onto something here. That's how we started, and a year later we actually got a gig. Well, it was after like the third or fourth gig, I remember this bloke used to hang around, a shadowy fella, unshaven, leather jacket, leather trousers, he used to lurk around at this venue, and he was mates with the promoter. And the promoter said, the two of us are putting a label together. I said, yeah, you and who? He said, well, him over there. And I thought, ooh, he looks like a shady character. But that was Joe Foster, who was ex of the TV personalities. And after like the third gig, he said, I'd like to uh, put a record out with you blokes. Oh, that's extraordinary. But we never heard anything from him for a while. So in the meantime, um, we did the Flexi, Preposterous Tales, with the football fanzine, blah, blah, blah. We just sent them a tape. They said, well, we do this fanzine. Well, that's how we got to know through the fanzine. So why don't you record it for a Flexi? We'll bring it out with that. And that's, that was the first record we brought out. Obviously, it got a lot of airplay. Yeah, Preposterous Tales have got, got the attention from, from the field for that. And at number 11, somebody may write in and correct me on this, but I think I'm right in saying the first Flexi disc to get into the festive 50. Hello, Ken. Well, here we are again. Another Friday night. I heard someone singing about you on the radio. Well, what can I get you? That's two light and bitters then. Before you start, Ken, let's keep it clean. I went out with a famous DJ sister's friend. I was on Cracker Jack at the age of ten. Oh, really? And I saw the Sex Pistols play down the 100 Club. Yeah, we all did. And I spent New Year's Eve at Sensible's Den. Preposterous tales. Now then, now then. Preposterous tales. Now then, now then. Preposterous tales in the life of Ken McKenzie. Preposterous tales. Now then, now then. Preposterous tales. Now then, now then. Preposterous tales in the life of Ken McKenzie. Boy, you're drinking fast tonight, Ken. Well, I've been a bit off my beer since you gave me that homebrew. What did you put inside it? Neat alcohol? I like a strong beer, Ken, but that was ridiculous. I lost a thousand pound playing brag last night. Come on, Ken. I flew to Amsterdam to start a riot. Really? And I once saw the Palace score four goals away from home. Oh yeah. And I've won every game of Trivial Pursuit I've ever played. Yeah, play me, preposterous Kent. tales. Now then, now then. Preposterous tales. Now then, now then. Preposterous tales in the pub with Ken McKenzie. Preposterous tales. Now then, now then. Preposterous tales. Now then, now then. Preposterous tales in the life of Ken McKenzie. Same old stories, eh, Ken? Ken drinking heavily again. Nothing changes. Is it my round again? I thought I've got the last. How much money did you bring out with you? I've got my cash point card if necessary. If necessary? So come on, let's have some more yarns. I once ate six miles bars in half an hour. Did you, Ken? While working on a site, I unearthed a bomb. Oh, did you, Ken? And I once had a shower with two American girls. What? Well, at the same time, Ken. Oh, that's cool. preposterous. Preposterous tales. Now then, now then. Preposterous tales. Now then, now then. Now then. Preposterous tales in the life of Ken McKenzie. Preposterous tales. Now then, now then. Preposterous tales. Now then, now then. Preposterous tales in the life of Ken McKenzie. Well, I've oh, nothing left to say, Ken. Well, let's have one for the road. Oh, why not? Preposterous tales. Now then, now then. Preposterous tales. Now then, now then. Preposterous tales in the life of Ken McKenzie. Preposterous tales. Now then, now then. Preposterous tales. Now then, now then. Preposterous tales in the life of Ken McKenzie. Oh, it's a late bar tonight. Did I tell you the story about when I apprehended yeah. a mugger outside Brixton Tube? Heard it all yes, before. What do you mean you don't believe me? It's What's true. Up, yeah. It's true, man. Everything yeah, I say is true. Yeah. I don't believe you, Ken.
um, and then Joe, of course, reappeared and said, hmm, yeah, hadn't forgotten you lads, let's do an LP, so, so we did. And um, so we've recorded the Posture of Tales ourselves in, in a studio that we found, ended up doing um, the stuff with Joe producing for the LP somewhere else, it's a bit more professional set up. And that was it. So we knew where we were, we were in the shops and roaring up the independent charts. Oh, for years it was content to slumber in a backwater of vocabulary, seldom used. And lately it has come to dominate the language. It has come to dominate N1 dinner parties. And has even been heard on grandstand. This word, a ludicrous. My baby's got jet lag for the seventh time this week. My baby's got jet lag. She can't be here tonight. My baby's got jet lag. Another day, another flight. I'm the only one not talking. Paula speaks of one thing. Rock stars in their underpants. Lydia talks about a new shop just opened off the King's Road. And Bob talks about there being no snow in Africa. We were asked to do a radio show on GLR. It was, it was going out on New Year's Eve. It wasn't recorded on New Year's Eve. And, and Paula was the guest uh, DJ. And the guy who um, was producing it was Trevor Dan, who, who was uh, an early uh, fan of ours. And he basically got us in and you know we were to, we were to do some song session for this show and uh, we prepared four songs to do and then when we got there Trevor Dan said no you are going to do the Bob Geldof song aren't you and we said no we're not, we haven't rehearsed it he says no you've got to do it because of Paulie Yates so anyway we did this we hastily uh, I hastily wrote the words out and uh, we did a version of it and uh, to be fair she was she was all right about it. She made out she was pissed off, but deep down I know that she was uh, she was laughing with us. And <laughs> Are you turning around and telling me to mind your P's and Q's? Are you turning around and telling me to put some polish on his shoes? He's out of bats. Oh, fancy that. Are you turning around and telling me flats? I mean, I like, I love, um, are you turning around and telling me? I, you know, which is 100% John. And when he he recorded that, and he didn't tell me, he didn't tell me he was writing it. And when he played me it, I just sat there and laughed for about 20 minutes, you know, sort of, what a great song, you know, where did he come up with this idea? I mean, there's an element of revenge in some of our songs, you know. Um, there's one or two songs written about people that I had dealings with and, obviously change their names, but they know who they are. My name is Trevor Barker. I'm coming to your town. I'm gonna make a few redundancies. I'm gonna close the plant down I drive a Mercedes Benz I own a Jaguar too My wife doesn't and need to mend I send my kids to public school I earn much more than you My speciality is turning round loss-making family companies into profit but through restructuring them and through the aggressive marketing of their products. I leave the day-to-day -day running to my managers for whom I supply the motivation. My aim is more power and I will never retire. My drives me higher And if I stop I will inspire I am Chairman of Carpets International I am a Business Man of the Year Read all about me in the Nationals 
funny enough, I got an email from uh, from Trevor from the guy I uh, I based Trevor Barker on the other day. Um, he doesn't. I don't think he knows he is Trevor Barker. Um, but he, uh, I'd actually, I'd actually um, mentioned him um, on a. It was a pa it was a Crystal Palace bulletin board, and we were talking about old bosses that we'd uh, worked for, and I'd written something about this guy, and he buddy found it, and um, was uh, wanted to he wanted to discuss he wanted me to discuss with him his managerial techniques, so I completely ignored that. <laughs> But the album sold out. I think they only pressed about 5,000 copies and it sold out. It should have been a bit more ambitious, really. But that was great. And then we did another, another one with Joe, which never got released, and then we sort of parted the ways. Any major label interest in us? No, we were. When we, when we were. When we had that flexi single in the. John Peel was playing a lot. I mean, we did, we did go and see at least one other. Independent label, didn't we? Um, but um, we weren't turning down that many offers. That's why we decided to go with Joe Foster. You know, because <laughs> I'll say this about Joe: he, you know, he he produced our first album, and I think he did a really good job. And um, oh, it's a shame, really, that the that the thing did go. Um, Pear shape because I, you know, I think uh, certainly at the beginning he, he helped us a lot in the studio and um, his production and he also he, he played he played on quite a number of tracks. Didn't he? I don't recall him playing on any. But he did the great. He did the guitar solo on uh, "Bring Out the Branson." <laughs> <laughs> And he did all the. Uh, oh, I get it. I get it. He got all the bass and uh, program the drum machine, and he, got, and he got me to sing over it. That's what I, that's what I seem to remember. Okay. Where is he tonight? When he got a gig? Who? Your group. Oh yeah. <laughs> He's not here, is he? Well, the second album is really the third album, of course, because the second album never came out uh, because of. Uh, Kaleidoscope went bankrupt. The official second album, Warning to the Curious, that was an album we'd, we, we'd recorded ourselves, but because we had no record contract, it took a long time, and that's right, Rodney Rodney came along and uh, put that house for us. So I'm, I'm always influenced by the colour of the sleeve, and that is very much a green LP, full of green music. <laughs> yeah, I think 30-something, we were trying to, sound, trying to sound like a proper rock band. and buying horrible clothes and you know trying to be like wham and uh, stuff like that and it, it which was I mean we were me and John were both punks really and I think when the when the sort of mid to late 80s came came along I mean everything that punk stood for sort of had gone out the window by then everybody then was into making money and you know thinking about their pensions rather than you know, well, let's do something creative and let's do something interesting and let's let's stick two fingers up 
at people. And the next thing I know, he's playing his guitar instead of laying bricks. House beautiful. A house beautiful. A Claire Rayner lives in my house. A house beautiful. A house beautiful. Sagittarius. Decor in the style of house beautiful. I think that album is quite, I think musically, is probably the nearest to the fall of, of any of our albums. I listen to it now and I can hear definite references to the fall uh, in that. It has been said in, in, in reviews that it is, sort of reveals the darker side of I Do Ludicrous and uh, yeah, some of it is, it is quite bleak. The tone of the subjects that we wrote about got a bit darker and I think that had something to do with the with what happened in, in Britain in the, in the early 90s with, you know, suddenly we had interest rates at 15% and nobody had a job and everybody was worried and um, and, and that sort of uh, found its way into some of our, you know, especially like Warning to the Curious which was written around about that time, you know, um, some of it's quite dark. I mean, I like We Will Fall, it was, um and that was something that was recorded in an afternoon in someone's caravan and it's got a good, a good gloomy feel to it. Because uh, we never we never wanted, we never intended to be funny, even though unfortunately we've been labelled for that. Uh, before the next tear-inducing media disaster, before the ozone layer thins further and my skin turns darker, before this generation to which I unwillingly belong gets away with a whole lifetime of self-indulgent, cosseted living. Who wants to be a spoiled grandparent in knee-length cycle pants or whatever, playing across the line, preaching and patronising to anyone who will listen? We will fall, won't we? Oh, we will fall, won't we? Oh, we will fall, won't we? We will fall. Before every event, where two people are gathered, becomes a media event. If a show's worth doing, it's worth doing by Janet Street Porter. In touch with the street, 
make up anything that rhymes over a mountain drum machine and pounding bass, we will fall, won't we? Oh, we will fall, won't we? Before isolation becomes complete and the universe contracts to the size of one's head. Travellers, don't tell me where you've been, it's of no interest. I wasn't there to share your educated observations. We will fall. We will fall, won't we? We will fall, won't we? Before therapy becomes compulsory and jokes are analysed for clues about subconscious unhappiness instead of being enjoyed. Before we are so polite that we never knowingly upset anyone. Before, oh we shall fall. I love television generally, but there again, I, I get very irritated by certain people on it. And I think, you know, I've spent a lot of time hating people on TV and talking about that to my friends and how much we hate so and so and so and so and what a ghastly person he must be in real life. Um, uh, well we're talking about Noel Edmonds here aren't we? I mean he's spent his... oh god I, he's irritated me all my life. I remember I think he first got on Radio 1 when I was about 12 or something and I hated him from day one and he's still going and we thought we'd got rid of him. We wrote this song about Noel Edmonds and he disappeared for 15 years and fuck me he's come back with a terrible fucking program on channel 4 you know, I, I like I like watching afternoon TV but you know that he comes on at 4.30 or whenever it is after Carol Baldwin and you know I have to turn off it's just that it's bang out of order Always check the grip on your shoes. 
Thank you. Everybody wants to have a lot of money in the future. Everyone can fit into our life plan. That shows that at a certain stage in a person's life, they are going to need a large cash sum. You are going to want to start a family and take that family on holiday. But Tony, I don't want to start a family. But you'll still want to take that family on holiday. I don't seem to fit into the life plan, Tony. Hello, it's Tony Lombardo. I've just won a trip to Monaco for being among the company's top 25 salesmen. I don't usually cold call. I have a wine. Last summer I spent at the Cold Care Research Centre in Kent. A two weeks in a self-contained oxygen tent. I didn't catch cold till I came home. A sleepless night. My nose is full of cement. Uh, listening to World Service on my radio. Uh, I haven't sent. And it's a minute wall's fade. Well, yeah, last night I was I wrote with a hangover <laughs> and um, yeah, I think we were trying to sound like Iggy and the Stooges on that one really, you know, and a bit of screaming going on and uh, uh, yeah, it's that, you know. It's, it's a good song, I like that. It's that horrible feeling when you wake up, and, you know, and you think, oh God, what did I do last night? And then you start remembering bits, I want, I want to know how last night I came home with an extra shoe came about. How did you, how did you get the shoe home? This is what's, well, what's I don't know. Thing. Were you wearing it? I don't know. I just I woke up and in my on my bedroom floor there was an there was a I had an extra shoe and, and I don't I can't still can't remember well, you what happened. You always get shoes on top top of bus shelves, don't you? Yeah, I probably I probably saw it. On the, you know, probably somebody threw it out and I picked it up on the way home after a kebab. <laughs> yeah, these things happen. Yeah. <laughs> but completely ratted. A lot of people said it, you know, a mistake. A lot of people said it's just a, a rip off of Totally Wired, haven't they, John? Yeah. <laughs> Kevin Jackson said that. <laughs> and he was wrong. Because he wasn't. I mean, well, right. um, syntactically, it might be. Different words, but different words. Similar sort of theme, but. Totally different song, isn't it? Oh, I completely agree. Yeah. No well, similarity think... whatsoever. <laughs> Like on the mouth. <laughs> I'm completely rested. <laughs> completely rested. <laughs> completely rested. And all I want is an orange juice. And all I want is a good excuse. Back the use of my and all my wavering lips and motor control. I'm completely ratted. <laughs> Last hour spent the five bucks on my suit. Last hour came home with an extra suit. Last hour came right off the rails. Last night Yes, Charity and Harry were synonymous for a long time, weren't they? Yeah. I, mean, I went to I went to a, um, a charity cricket match once, and Harry Seacombe was playing. You know, and I don't know. He had this great. Everyone was so pleased to see Harry Seacombe. You know, and I, I, mean, I never got, never quite got Harry Seacombe, so I, I missed out on the goons, and I just remember him from. From these dreadful religious programs that he used to do on the Sunday afternoon, which my, I had to watch with my grand, you know, and think, oh, fuck off, Harry, you know. <laughs> I'm 
meant to be headlock. We were meant to be we were meant to be supporting a local band. I think they were a thrash band or something. And it was in this council estate in Folkestone. And anyway this this main band cancelled for some reason so we had to go on as as the headline um, to an audience. I mean and it was the, the promoter put us on because he liked us. But um, the young, the bright young things of Folkestone, um, we weren't their cup of tea at all. They were expecting um, thrash metal, and instead they got, you know, quite extraordinary and um, Sunday lunch at the Geldofs. And I think we managed. I think we were on our fourth fourth number before the sandwich. Somebody started throwing sandwiches at us, by which we uh, hastily left the stage. I think playing Reading. We, we supported the Ford at Reading University, um, and it was a Christmas. It was, a, I think, the Christmas ball or something. It was absolutely full, and we went on, and um, we had a good sound, uh, and the audience were into it, and actually listened and laughed at the right places. And no, we played really well. That was, I remember coming off that stage then, thinking, oh, you know, this is, this is brilliant. Um, and then we did a great gig in Germany once. Well, the only time we went out to Germany and we played a squat. Uh, we were supposed to be playing this club and it, we couldn't, I think the mayor had had the walls painted or something and wouldn't, and wouldn't let us play there. So they, they found this club which had been, over, which had been uh, taken over with squatters. Um, but being in Germany, it was a very well organised squat, you know, with a great sound system and they had beer, they were selling beer and, uh, and it was just a great gig. And there was one bit and we had, there was we had a dog on the stage. Uh, John collapsed and it had to be like spinal tap. I had to sort of pick he went he went down and played this guitar solo, you know, on his back and then he couldn't get back up. <laughs> So I had to help him back up. The whole thing was just funny. It's our solo. It was like Lauren Hardy. It was like Lauren Hardy show for 45 minutes that night. It was good. And when we started, um, nobody was writing songs about sport. I mean, there, there was kicker conspiracy by the fall, uh, which probably gave us the idea. But um, no, I mean it wasn't deliberate. We didn't deliberately set out to write songs about sport. I remember three English football grounds. 
Um, I wrote that on the on the coach back from Manchester. The way a lot of songs have come up in the past, I've said is I'll write something, and he'll put some words on. He'll have his words already. I've got my music ready, the words ready. We put the two together, and they fit. It's happened lots of times. Three English football grounds facing the I've been up to see a mate in Manchester the weekend, and I've been to see a football match. Yeah. And I just started, and I am just just doodling on the on the coach on the on the way back, and I just wrote these three verses, you know, and I showed them to John, and then John came up with a bloody good riff. Oh, welcome to the Den, London South East 14. Do not believe all you read or hear. We are not animals. We are human beings. Our support is loyal. Their enthusiasm only leads to violence as a result of immense provocation. Here is station these new cross gates. Three pound to get in, and the beer is cold. We're always known as being a sporty man, and we used to get mentioned in the Guardian sports section and stuff like that. And a couple of people said, you know, they thought, you know, you mustn't write about football. It's a bit naff, you know. It's not commercial. And in the in the mid '80s. If you said you're a football fan, it was almost not quite as bad as being a paedophile, but you know it wasn't far removed from it. You know, it was just like, oh god, you know, you must be a, you must be a hooligan sort of thing. That's what Kevin Jackson thought that anyway. Um, and then of course now everyone writes songs about football, and <laughs> and everyone's forgotten us. So. <laughs> Well, I mean, most of our football songs actually aren't about football. I mean, they're about the grounds. Or they're about being a fan. I remember when I uh, when I had the idea, and I used to, I used to thump and I got that. I used to I thump my chest, and I said, "We stand around in wind and rain," and it was very much like that to start with, you know. Um, and it it got mellowed as uh, as John got hold of it and everything. No, but it was it was meant to be. A, you know, it was about being a football fan before you know uh, before it became fashionable and, and being treated like animals wherever you went and therefore you tended to act like an animal you know um, you know sadly sadly I think football fans now they're treated a lot better they still act like animals most of the or some of them but um, yeah so I suppose it, yeah it started out as quite a sinister song I think the so the key line is actually the, the one at the very the line at the very end, which uh, this one it says football fans grow up, and it was almost like saying, well, why do you put up with this shit? You know, um, you know, you're spending all this money, you're doing all this thing, and you're being treated like uh, you're being treated badly. Why do you do it? You know. <laughs> And it was that was almost me. That was almost me saying to myself, you know, yeah, you got to, you're wasting your time doing this, you know. You're much better off being in a band, trying to do something creative. Because it was one of the first songs we wrote, and it got, it got forgotten. Because um, when we started off, we had so many songs, and uh, we forgot about it. And then I think it was John who was going through some back tapes and found it, a very rough version of it, and then. Um, he worked, we worked on it, and, there, and it became the key, out, the key track on Idiot Savant. in voluntary all ages all male all swearing all cold we sing and sway we punch the air we 
chant out names, we seek a way In pens we huddle, in corners too We shout out loud, we shout abuse We travel every Saturday We go wherever we play and pay Spending money we can't afford We are the fans, we go everywhere of two we punch the air we sing and sway and dance and swear we talk the home fans humorously policemen eyes us with ill disguised contempt our best players all get sold their replacements old and slow the manager raids the Sunday leagues we have no youth team anymore the team defends most of the game we cheer every breakaway three in the box it goes to cross we hold our breath I kind of thought 
we didn't have any real management of any sort. I was kind of uneasy about. Um, well, I, 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 didn't, I think the two-piece worked. I mean, subsequently being proved wrong by so many two-piece groups that they can actually do it. I mean, technology has advanced a little bit. Our own technology, limited as it is, advanced with the different drum machines, etc. Um, I kind of wondered, well, can we can we do this? Um, and and the, the songwriting goes in peaks and troughs. So, uh, we, we, but we never actually stopped. We, we kept doing gigs if we were asked to, and, and we kept recording things and writing things. Uh, but when you're sort of bringing it out yourself, resources are limited, and so you take longer. And, but we eventually did it with um, the Idiot Seven CD, and that you know. I think in some quarters are very highly regarded. It's just one of my favourite things I've done, really. We wheel and we deal and we duck and we dive. Some people think we're the craftiest of villains alive. But you nothing to fear if we knock on your door. The only killings we make is on the dealing room floor. These Nenders, pride of the South. These Nenders, never a dan in the mouth. These Nenders, a sort of the earth. EastEnders, which I love EastEnders, that's, that's, that's the job. Uh, I mean, EastEnders is basically what I was saying earlier. It's sort of a song that came out of loads of conversations that me and John had had about people who live in the East End, you know, and you know, the way they like their, their Rottweilers and, you know, they call their daughters princess and, and then, you know, they love their mum and they start crying when they start thinking about their nan and, and that all, all sort of came together and John was brilliant, he brought it all together in one song. And it was sort of inspired, a friend of ours had moved to the East End and he was a very funny guy and he worked here as well, Phil Rose. And he was telling me, and he was quite a, a, a good observer of things, you know, and he'd, he'd lived in Hackney for about 18 months. And he, he said, oh yeah, I saw my neighbour the other day, he said this old East Ender and he, over the garden fence, he said, he said, he said, weren't sure about you when you moved in, mate, but, you know, yeah, I can see you're one of us. And Phil said, well, that's one of the most chilling things that ever been said to him. I read about a band in South Beach, 23, I thought it meant me. I thought it meant me Riding around on a 68 bus I thought it was us I thought it was us I phoned Steve Lamac and said Who do you mean? He said Carter The unstoppable sex machine I asked John Feaster Where is the scene? He said Carter The unstoppable sex machine Carter The unstoppable sex machine My computer engineer comes Oh the computer engineer comes Nothing like this before. Look at this transistor. It's completely melted. It could have been caused by the static of your carpet. But girls all like him. He looks like Sting. But I despise him with all my being. Sting, where is thy death? Oh, Sting. Twice. <laughs> Twice. Yeah. Sting, where is thy... Where is... Sting, where is... Sting, where is thy death, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, another trial of Sting. Strangely enough, both John's songs. Uh, oh, but no, that both John's lines, actually. And, um... Believe it or not, John's, John's just moved down to Salisbury and um, apparently he lives very close to Sting. So we were hoping maybe that we might get him along to, to play bass on the next album. Uh, so, as long as he doesn't, he's not allowed to sing, he's got to keep his mouth shut, you know, but uh, if he wants to come in and do the bass, that'll be fine, yeah, you know. <laughs> no money in it, obviously, you know, <laughs> but for artistic reasons, he should do it. Sylvain de Crane, 
came back from Spain Wearing a tan you could chalk your name on That's no surprise when the temperatures rise Into the 80s and 90s It was that hot in England last summer You, you live in England Where your idea of a summer's day is a flammy shirt and a can of squirts And when the sky is blue it's grey It's different out there It's kind of a dry heat Oh really? That's, oh really? That's, that's, that's come out. I, I, I just like the way the instrumentations come out on that. Um, I know everyone says it's the, it's the vocals and lyrics are the key thing, but I try to put a bit of effort into making the music a bit more interesting there. And it, and I, well, for me it worked, so, and I think for other people it might have done too, so I like those. All these people would, that we'd know had gone off travelling and then come back and then bored us with all these terrible stories about, oh, you know, it was great when we were up the Amazon and, and you think, oh, really, you know. Doesn't sound great to me, you know. I'd rather get the Isle of Wight. Hey, Will, it's Johnny Ludicrous here. Are you going to the match tomorrow? Peter's coming up, and I've talked Sandra to come in too. We're meeting in the cherry trees. We can talk about our next album. We need to get together soon if we're going on tour with Carter USM. They want an answer by next week. Hey, where's your old friend Tom? I've got this great idea for a song. You know, sometimes it's difficult to, to squeeze the band in amongst other things, and when your when your personal life is going going a bit pear-shaped or things are, things are going on that you know that can sort of affect us and I think that's um, and that was the time John John moved out of London um, so we didn't see each other as much John wrote um, Approaching 40, completely out of the blue, and when I heard this I thought, oh this is a, gr this is a great song, uh, even though I think by that time we were both past 40, but uh, so we decided to bring out an EP, 
and just to see how it would do because um, we weren't sure there was anybody out there still wanting to hear our stuff. I'm getting ready for my best years approaching 40 Not as unhappy as I could be approaching 40 I never hark back to my twenties approaching forty my mind and body largely intact could be a goalie could win a Grand Prix approaching forty don't call me granddad point out my thin patch approaching forty don't say We brought out Approaching 40 and we did that ourselves and we were quite surprised at uh, how many it sold. I mean, we only sold it over our internet, it wasn't in any shops. Um, but it, it was sort of encouraging really and people then contacted us and saying, you know, um, we think you're great and you know, why don't you, when's the next, when are you playing next and everything. And I suppose that gave us the encouragement to, to carry on I suppose and then um, after that we brought out Museum of Installation. Most of the songs there are John's again because um, I went a long time when I couldn't because I don't play an instrument um, it's quite difficult for me to write songs on my own um, and I hadn't come up with anything for a long time um, until we're the support band which um, John was just tuning up before a rehearsal and making this horrible song, horrible noise with the drum machine. And that just sort of came off the top of my head, you know. Um, the guitar's out of tune, we're not very good with a support band. And that song basically wrote itself after that. Um, and that's some, that sometimes happens, you know. Sometimes you, a song can, can, you can write a song almost in five seconds. Um, and they tend to be the better ones as well, strangely. Say goodbye, don't you cry like a moron Reach for the sky, I'll have some of what you're on Today is just the parting of the ways There's no need to be theatrical About addiction, that's another John song um, John dreams a lot of songs, and that was, uh, he dreamt that song. <laughs> our stadium rocker, yeah, our anthem. It came to me in a dream, I think. In um, <laughs> quite funny circumstances. I went to see The Fall in Salisbury with a mate of mine. Um, and I was explaining, this is before I lived down that way, I was explaining to him how, um, how I often dream these songs. They come to me in a dream, I either remember them or I don't. And that night he said, when we party, he said, well, come home and dream a song. <laughs> and I did that night, I dreamt that one. And he was in the dream. He actually contributed to the lyrics in the dream, funnily enough. He came out with a hook like a moron. So I, I suppose I should really give him the credit. Yeah, that's kind of our big big stadium rocker. I think the Verve should have done a cover version of that, to be quite honest. I think they'd, I think they'd have made a good job of that. I remember Graham Dude's party. Yeah! A grand food party. Gate crasher was quite as a mouse. A grand food party. Students drunk cider out of China mugs. A grand food party. A grand food party Some people still regret going To grand food party 
I just love the line, cab driver called and he had the wrong house. I don't know why I like it, it's a silly little line, but... I mean, all those lines refer to incidents or combinations of incidents that actually did happen. And I wasn't necessarily there when those things happened, but I heard about them and, and, and wrote about them. Um, Graham, it was originally called Graham Dude's Party, because we used to know a bloke at U university called Graham, and we called him, and we, him and his mate Steve, we just referred to him as a couple of dudes. So they were Graham Dude and Steve Dude. We only ever saw these people at parties. So, and some of these strange incidents happened at these parties. I mean, it starts off, first part, half of that song is about nice, jolly things happening. Second half, it all falls apart and turns nasty, you know, <laughs> like, like real life. <laughs> And I've never been hit by Marky Smith. Before this, fantastic band. But it's almost, it's a bit of a joke actually. Um, uh, references to the fall. Um, because we were obviously influenced at the start and then Mark, Mark gave us a, 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 a lot of help in our early days and we played with them and uh, um, and some of our songs are almost deliberate, um, deliberately nicked from the fall, you know. You know, we write a song and we think, if Smith, is, would Smith like this? Or, you know, uh, it's always sort of an undercurrent in our, in our work, you know. Uh, but it's more, of a, it's more of a joke, it's more of a running gag, I'd say. I've taken every drug I can, from active to fill his sand. I drove a motorbike across Iran and spent some time in a caravan. I used violence to impress my friends. I'm building an empire that'll never end. Cause I've never been loved and I've never been hugged and I've never been mugged and I've never been drugged. Never been hit by Marquis Smith. I mean, that was that was more to do about um, the hard time Smithy was getting in the in the press when um, uh, you know the wheels fell off the, the fall and, uh, and he went to America and he got arrested and stuff like this. And there was all these stories in the music press about Smith. And, uh, I just thought, well, you know, well, I actually know, I've met Mark, and he's a great bloke, and I mean, these stories don't ring true to me that he's such such a bastard. And if he is being a bastard, then it's it's probably a big act, um, or he knows exactly what he's doing, you know. Um, so that was that was the motive behind that. We were, we were invited to uh, support The Fall by uh, Mark E. Smith himself uh, after he heard our great new CD. Um, and we were meant to do seven gigs and um, the first four went off quite well and uh, felt we were getting on alright with the, uh, the full entourage and then um, there was a bit of a break uh, in the tour and the next gig uh, we were supposed to play was London. Um, anyway, I phoned up the tour management on the, uh, on the, on the afternoon to check what time uh, we were expected for the sound check to be told we'd been kicked off the tour. Um, which was a bit of a shock, and the, the reason given was the uh, the blog I was doing for the Guardian, and uh, I'd uh, apparently um, I'd mentioned things like whiskey being drunk in hotels, and of course, as we know, Marky e. Smith is a teetotaler, uh, and uh, he was upset by this, so that was it. So we uh, we we left the tour with our tails between our legs, um, being owed quite a lot of money and loads of irate, I ludicrous fans um, emailing me to say where the hell were we? Well the last thing I said to Marky e. Smith was um, see you next Wednesday and I think I was one day out. My favourite records! 
I was brought up on the Beatles. Then I went off to grammar school. Got into all that progressive crap. Nowadays I have to deny it all. I mention this because it came up in conversation the other night in the old King Life. I was having a beer with Glenn Bedwin. He's an expert. He's got all the original releases on the legendary White Flamingo label. Must be worth a fortune. Because you know, we brought out uh, our own, what we call the official bootleg series of CDs, because that's the way we did our sort of back catalogue. Um, and obviously that worked to an extent because it came to the attention of the chap at Sound he said, would you like to do this properly? So, so that's what we've done. 20 years in show business came out. That's given us another sort of um, kick up the backside really. And uh, we're writing, we've written a bunch of new songs in the last six months and, um, you know, Amongst the best, amongst the best stuff we've done, actually. Chaving it up with Jeremy Carl. I mean, that was just two chords. Will said, "Should we have something different in the middle?" And I thought about it. And I thought, well, if we do it, we'll turn it into a Doctor Feelgood song. If we leave it as it is, it's, a, it's an Ludicrous song, and I'm happy with it. It's worth checking out. He is an exceptionally nasty piece of work, Jeremy. Yeah. And what I hate about him, he's always gone on about, you know, he's a self-made man. And if I can, if I can get my own program on national TV, then anyone can. A failing system which casualties Could source material for Jeremy You gotta chat it up, baby, once in a while Chat it up, baby, you're a Jeremy Kyle Chat it up, baby, the crowd's going wild Chat it up, baby, Jeremy Kyle I'm driving to, don't tell anybody this, don't tell a soul that I was driving on Because, oh, I wish I was in a group like Genesis <laughs> Oh dear, Genesis <laughs> I remember I bought nursery crimes in 1973 because peer pressure at school. And I remember all these hippies were like, oh, you got to listen to Genesis, man, it's great. And they sing songs about hogweed. So, oh, that sounds interesting, you know. <laughs> Way back, way back, we did have a period where we would rehearse every fortnight. Um, but I don't think we came up with any more ideas doing it that way than we do now. I mean, take a group like from way back when Pavement, who apparently live in 
four different corners of America and, and they managed it. It ought to be easier now with um, electronic communication. We've not actually kind of used that, but it's there. You know, I could come up with a little riff and just made it to him. If he could figure out how to open the file, <laughs> you could listen to it. <laughs> I definitely think there's advantages in not being a full-time band. Um, all right, you know, you don't go on tours and you don't have, uh, you know, you don't stay in holiday inns or stuff like that. But you know, um, John and I are 50 now. And we're still, we still like each other. We're still playing. We're still, we're solvent. We haven't got too many mental problems. And I think, you know, if we'd have, say, we'd have gone full-time in. And, and spent years, you know, travelling the world singing songs. You know, I think, well, I'm sure we wouldn't still be together, you know. Don't tell Will about my solo projects that I'm working on. You know. um, I mean, there are. I want to make another album with us, at least another one, maybe more. Um, but I've also got a few bits in the back of my mind, mostly instrumental bits and things that wouldn't be ideal. Just things. things in the sort of the Eno vein, I like to think. And I'd quite like to record all that and see that all sink in our face. Um, we've probably got another good album in us. And then take it from there, you know. I mean, we always, me and John joke about, you know, being too old to do this. And perhaps we should pack up. And Know, and get the pipe and slippers out and but you know you know as they say 50s and you 30 or whatever so uh, we've got at least another 10 years in us all right <laughs> Such a pretty nasty thing about people. But can you imagine a comedy landscape today without a genius? Without her, there'd be no Catherine Tate. I think Ruby Wax is one of our. At the moment, I know it, I know it's nearly eight minutes long and and stuff. But yeah, that makes me laugh because I think that in many ways that is almost a typical Illudica song. I mean, it starts off with you know very minimal spoken words you know what's what's this go oh they're having to go at ruby wax here you know or, or are we this, perhaps we're not i don't know and then and it just builds and builds and builds and and then at the end you know um and i think the the really funny bit is the is the sympathy for the devil um bit that uh, that just came to us actually um when we were doing it, you know, and we almost we almost had that idea at the same time. It was one of those bits in the studio when, when we were going on it, and it was just like, well, we've got to do some ooze now, you know. It's obviously it's obviously similar to Sympathy for the Devil. I'm not saying it's as good, but there are elements there.
any last thoughts? What would you do without me, John? <laughs> Better up out of it. I would do that, yeah, well I wouldn't. Well, I don't know. No, I wouldn't. My voice wouldn't carry. Right. So I couldn't be, um, you know, it wouldn't work, would it? So well, to use the old Spike Milligan joke when he said to Harry Seacombe, he, he said to Harry Seacombe, said, I hope I die before you. He said, I don't want you singing at my wedding, at my funeral. <laughs> <laughs> I got that wrong, didn't I? I got that wrong. Should we wind it up? <laughs>